healthcare is too expensive. Employers are offsetting costs onto their employees. Who will make health benefits affordable for hard-working Americans and their families? You, you will. will. This is the Empowering Plans Podcast, a show dedicated to helping you once again emphasize the benefits in your benefit plan. Now prepare to learn, plan, save, and protect with the FIA Group. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Powering Plans podcast. I'm losing track of what number this is, but it's got to be well over the 100s by now. And this time we're recording the week of Thanksgiving, wrapping up the year pretty quickly here in 2023. And I've got with me today, attorney Andrew Silverio. Say hello, Andrew. Hello, Andrew. Perfect. Starting off just right. We have a great topic today we want to talk about with you all. Something that we've covered on our webinar, I think two months ago, it was an important ruling that came out of the DC circuit, which was about copay accumulator programs. Those are the popular programs that we see used in our industry and have been around for years that are really meant to help patients to manage the cost of specialty drugs. And there's been really a ton of back and forth with rules and regulations, different interpretations of when they are allowed, when they're not allowed. There's been a lot of critiques of these programs as well, if we're being fair. Some people pointing out the fact that they actually, in some cases, can cause patients to pay more money. And other people saying that manufacturers use these programs as a way to incentivize people to pick more expensive specialty drugs and actually drives the cost up for plans themselves. So it seems like no one's really happy here with this topic and the use of these programs. It's not perfect, but this case is very important. It's called HIV and Hepatitis Policy Institute versus HHS. And it was a case that was brought by patient advocacy groups a couple of years ago and made its way through the courts here. The case was brought in response to a rule from the Trump administration. And before I give away the game, I'll let Andrew jump in and kind of describe maybe what the rule was about and what this case was about. And we can talk about why we think it's so important for the industry. Sure. Thanks. So the rule is actually the 2021 edition of the Notice of Benefit and Payment Parameters. So much like the CAA of 2021, it's something that's issued every year. Sometimes it has a big impact, sometimes it does not. For example, the 2021 CAA just happened to include the No Surprises Act and a bunch of other very substantial rules that impact healthcare a lot. So the 2021 Notice of Benefit and Payment Parameters like Brady said, out of the Trump administration, pretty significantly changed what payers are allowed to do in regard to cost sharing that is paid by manufacturers under these manufacturer assistance programs. So over the years, these programs have sort of evolved along regulatory guidance. And when they first came out, I don't even know, maybe six, seven years ago, or at least when we started seeing them. One of the first questions that I personally had, they were pretty simple programs. They would basically just pair up a patient with an advocate who would help them try to get any assistance that was available. So they're in the form of copay cards. The manufacturer will basically cover your deductible, your copayment, what have you, to reduce the cost sharing impact to the patient so that they'll basically pick the more expensive specialty drug that the manufacturer wants them taking. We're talking here about very expensive drugs, you know, thousands of dollars per month, sometimes even tens of thousands of dollars per month. One of my first questions was, isn't the patient just going to hit their out-of-pocket maximum in a month or two, at which point the plan can't save anymore? You're paying at 100%. These programs obviously identified that issue as well. And then to be able to remove the lid basically from the savings that you can create. You just said we're no longer going to count amounts that manufacturers pay or credit to patients towards those patients out of pocket maximums. So this 2021 rule, which was released in, I believe, May of 2020, it basically expanded on the prior guidance, which distinguished between situations where there's a generic alternative for the drug and when there isn't, there was some contradictory guidance, a conflict with the previous IRS rule. It was just pretty messy. This new rule just said the payer gets to decide. Basically, they can do whatever they want. They can count manufacturer assistance amounts towards out-of-pocket maximums. They can choose not to count them towards out-of-pocket maximums, whether there's a generic alternative or not. So they left it to the payers to decide, basically approving this approach that the manufacturer assistance programs are relying on to create big savings when patients use these high-cost drugs. Yeah, it's worth noting here, Andrew, that, you know, the court went back to the definition of cost sharing that's within the ACA itself to determine in part their ruling. When the definition there, 
It says here, any expenditure required by or on behalf of an enrollee with respect to essential health benefits, including deductibles, co-insurance, co-payments, or similar charges, but excludes premiums, balance bill amounts for non-network providers, and spending for non-covered services. That's a very important definition that comes up in a lot of different contexts for us when we're deciding or consulting on whether or not certain expenditures should be counted right toward the out-of-pocket maximum and deductible of a patient. And our interpretation before this court ruling years ago, when we first started seeing this, as you mentioned, when we were asked the question is that we thought these programs where you're offering a coupon or some kind of a code to apply assistance to help the patient, we thought that met the definition of cost sharing, that it effectively you know, should have been categorized as such from the start. And here we have this court basically finding the same thing and they rejected the arguments by the manufacturers that were saying this is not technically cost sharing. You know, they're basically relying on some technicality about well, the patient is not technically paying themselves and the court didn't buy that. And it's really a big development because most high cost drugs have some kind of program like this. And when we talk about savings, right? There's two ways to generate savings. One of course is for the price to come down to the actual drug. And we know that's not happening. And the second way, of course, is to have the patient be bearing more of the burden here. And what was happening over time, and you can find cases about this in news articles about these programs, is that patients were actually spending way more money than they realized they were going to need to to pay for these drugs. And some of them were being bankrupted by the fact that they were never hitting their out-of-pocket max. They're paying a ton of money in cost sharing. And on top of that, the price of a drug wasn't coming down. So it really wasn't a good scenario for anyone involved. And a number of states took some action as well before this court case came out. I looked at some data this morning that showed about 19 states, I think as of June 2023, have implemented bans on these programs. So states were already acting, and this is kind of the reaction from the federal court here catching up to it. But with all this said, what does this mean now for us going forward, for our industry, for manufacturers? What do people have to do or be aware of, Andrew, as a result of this ruling? Yeah, Brady, that's a good question and one that does not have a really clean answer. What the actual holding of this decision did was strike down the 2021 rule, which had authorized payers to not count these amounts towards cost sharing accumulators, deductibles, et cetera, in situations where there's no generic alternative available to a drug. So striking down that rule, what we're left with technically is the prior version of the rule, which had still allowed this practice, but only in situations where there is a generic alternative available. So the rationale there would be you can create that sort of disincentive to try to steer people towards the generic when it's available. If they choose not to use the generic, I guess the regulators are more comfortable with, you know, quote unquote, punishing the patient by not counting those amounts. So, right, that's the literal holding of the rule. However, looking through the case, all of the statutory analysis that they do, it doesn't hinge on that sort of a distinction in any way. Like Brady said, we're looking at the statutory and regulatory definitions of the term cost sharing. There are a lot of them, but the one that the decision really hinged on and the court focused on is the one that included that key language paid by or on behalf of a participant. So looking at all the rationale of the court the analysis of the laws, there's really no basis to make that distinction to say you can do it in some situations, but not others. Really, I think the prudent approach based on this decision is to count manufacturer assistance amounts towards deductibles, towards out-of-pocket maximums, whether there's a generic alternative or not. I would not hang my hat on the fact that really the technicality that the rule struck down only touched on one situation. All the analysis, all the legal rationale, it applies across the board. Yeah, and Andrew, that's a good point because these patient advocacy groups have noted that they're actually not satisfied with this ruling. They're coming for the rest of it as well. So in their view is what you're saying here is they would rather see a requirement that all of these coupons are counted toward cost sharing, regardless of the status of there being a generic available. And I suspect that this is probably what they'll get because if you read the ruling as we have, again, the statutory analysis is pretty clear. I don't see how the distinction really can be maintained into the future. But for now, it's not clear if there'll be an appeal by the government. I don't think that's likely, given the fact that the rule, of course, was fought for under the Trump administration, and we currently have a different administration in place now. But we'll, of course, monitor that into the future and see if anything's you know, changing there with respect to court rulings. But yeah, if you're you know, a plan who is using one of these programs, you need to talk to the vendor you're using because the rule here has changed, and you've got to communicate that to participants as well. So that they're aware of what is and what is not being counted toward their cost sharing amounts and 
ultimately how much they're paying out of pocket for these programs. But I want to end with just a note here saying that these programs, again, if you go back to why they were utilize a sort of cat and mouse game between manufacturers and plan sponsors. It's really emblematic of a larger problem, which is the price of these drugs just generally. Every few months, we're talking about record-breaking prices for new kinds of drugs and manufacturers. They're incentivized to get insurance to pay for these drugs as quickly as possible. Whether you're talking about these musculoskeletal treatment drugs or weight loss drugs even, there's really a rush to get approval of these drugs and to get insurance paying for them. And as a counter by insurance companies and plan sponsors to try and impose cost sharing, to have not just the plan or the insurer bear the full cost and the patient often gets stuck in the middle. And so until there's some kind of clear legislative action, I think you're gonna to continue to see rules that are passed by different administrations that get struck down eventually by courts if they go too far. I think this is gonna keep happening probably for the next few years would be my guess. So. Any last thoughts from you on that, Andrew? Yeah, not really. Just the fact that, like you said, we have a different administration now defending this rule that they didn't implement. So, you know, with it being kicked back to them to come up with a consistent and plausible interpretation of these cost sharing rules, I don't think, you know, we're going to need to wait and see another lawsuit play out or an appeal. We'll, we'll see new guidance from the departments outlining how these situations should play out. And I think that they'll cover both situations. Definitely. I think you're right about that. And I think that's probably a good place to end for now in our continuing discussion here on the podcast about specialty drugs. So hopefully everyone has a good holiday and a good Thanksgiving break. I know we will as well, and we'll come back refreshed and see you all on the other side. So thanks for tuning in to another edition of the podcast. Take care.